My dad was in the fish processing business. Uh, he bought fish from the uh, fishermen. He had a plant. He processed them, such as canned lobsters and canned salmon, uh, shipped live lobsters and, uh, and uh, fish to Toronto and Montreal. Um, and um, he had quite a few people working for him in the, in, the, in the plant. My mom was a nurse. She graduated from the Montreal General Hospital in 1901. She was the first nurse to graduate on the Gaspé Coast. My mom was the organist in the local church. She had a beautiful voice. She sang on the radio in New Carlisle. She had a beautiful voice. She also played the piano. Very, very, very musical and very artistic. So uh, they married and uh, had five children, two boys and three girls. My two brothers were killed in car accidents separately. And uh, my eldest sister, Linda, died at 95. And my second sister, Gwen, died at 82. My uh, second brother, Lockhart, uh, he used to take me wherever, because I was a, a fair distance behind them. Wherever he went, uh, he'd take me and. Uh, if he was fixing the boat, uh, he had a boat, uh, a fishing boat, a big one, and uh, if it had to, some engine work to do, he'd take me down and he'd tell me, get this tool, get that tool. And uh, when he delivered, uh, when he went around selling fish uh, to, the, uh, to the farmers, etc., along the, uh, the coast, he would take me. He always seemed to wanted me to. Often he took me out for an ice cream cone before he took his girlfriend out. I had a doll that I really never played with because I was afraid to harm it in it, you know, break it, etc. And I had a bunny rabbit, a plush bunny. And that's, those are the toys I had as, as a child. Today, the children have so many toys, they don't know which one to play with. Uh, I had so few. Uh, secondly, I wore secondhand clothes. We used to get the Eaton's and Simpson's cattle on because that was distributed to us. And you'd go through it and see all the wonderful things in it, knowing you couldn't have them. And the only thing I ever envied, I guess, was when you'd get the, the catalogs come in and show all the wonderful things that were available that you had no, no possibility of ever enjoying. So you, you learn to accept the few things you had and appreciate it. That's why we, 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 you know, we made our own fun, you know, uh, uh, when, because we didn't have community centers and arenas and we didn't have a library for once. The only books we had was at school. I uh, went to a two-room schoolhouse heated with wood stoves, etc., uh, uh, and it only went to grade nine. Uh, one, one teacher, you know, one teacher on each floor, that was it. You didn't have a number of teachers. They taught everything. And uh, so it, it, it uh, but you, you grew up uh, with so little, but uh, everybody was in the same boat, it seemed. She always says that they were so poor that all they had to eat was fish, and she's do, saying it humorously. But she was saying, you know, my dad worked in a fish processing packing plant because he was right, they were right there where, the, when the fish came in, in the boats. And uh, 
And so she said, so we'd have fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When I went to, away to school uh, in, in St. John's, Quebec, with my sister, she taught in, at the school in St. John's, took me away with her for grade 10. We stayed at the Anglican, we boarded with the Anglican minister and his wife in St. John's, Quebec. Wow. Then when I went to Quebec City for my final year in high school, I attended uh, the cathedral in Quebec, the Anglican Cathedral in Quebec City. And then when I uh, went to uh, Montreal, I uh, attended uh, Christ Church in Montreal, Anglican Church. So I was always uh, uh, connected with my church. And then, of course, when I came to Toronto and joined St. Michael All Angels Church, that's when I got in the AYPA and became national president of the Anglican Young People's Association of Canada. If we look at the records of the Anglican Young People's Association from the 1940s and early 1950s when Hazel McCallion takes over as president, she quickly realizes that this organization has many disparate interests, many minor complaints are coming from here and there. Um, it's this loose amalgam. What am I going to do? First priority, to be seen by the people I'm here to serve. And she embarked on a trip uh, to Eastern Canada, you know, visiting places where people from Central Canada often would not even bother to go um, in the late 1940s. But the kind of loyalty that she was able to build to herself and to the organization in being seen by people who had never seen the president of the organization before impressed upon her how important it was to keep doing that. And you would see her in subsequent years taking more and more of these trips, sometimes even being quite content to let some of the technical stuff in the office get delayed, just so that she could have that direct relationship with, with her people. I think a, a thing that impacted my life was when I was chosen to go to the Second World Conference of Christian Youth in Oslo, Norway, in 1947, meeting youth from all over the world except Japan and, uh, and Germany because it was just after the war. And uh, to meet young people from across the world uh, and their, their, their uh, uh, association was wonderful. It was bad times. 1947 was just after the war. And um, that, that imp uh, made a major impact on my life, the, to meet with people that were of the same faith that I was and, and young people that were anxious to, uh, to do good things. Uh, it, uh, it was a wonderful experience, a marvelous experience. I was working then at Canadian Kellogg, of course, and uh, my job was very important to me. You know, we built the world's first synthetic rubber plant. Well, that's how I got transferred by my company from Montreal to Toronto. So they transferred the head office from Montreal to Toronto so that I could remain in charge of it until we got back into the contracting business again and uh, uh, building oil refineries. 